Well, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you so much for tuning in um, to the Freedom Association's latest webinar. We've had some very good ones on defense, for example, uh, recently. But tonight is a very critical one uh, entitled The British Union at Risk, How, how Do We Fight Back? Um, it is indeed very topical because we got the results of the um, Nicola Sturgeon vote of no confidence. Unfortunately, she's got away with it. Uh, but that was uh, earlier today, um, and uh, but that's not the end of the story. So uh, there's an awful lot going on in this field. Um, I just wanted to make a few remarks uh, first before introducing um, the panel, an excellent panel tonight individually as we go, if I may. We're covering all four nations, you'll, you'll be glad to know. Um, I think the first thing I would say, I'd make three quick points. Uh, the first thing is that, um, in my view, patriotism and nationalism are not the same. That, uh, you know, to be a patriot, you, you just have a simple love of country, but nationalists tend to have, can only love their country by uh, disliking other countries or even hating other countries. And there is a nasty streak, and I saw that in the European Parliament when I was a member. Um, I would say my first main point is that we seem to have a problem with devolution in the sense we have a silo approach, a bit like grain silos. Um, whereas, for example, healthcare is, is, is delegated fully to the individual nations. And it seems very wrong to me that, you know, Scotland can have a border with England or Wales can have a border with England or, or between GB and Northern Ireland, as, as Kate will, will no doubt touch on. Um, and, and um, you know, I think the COVID um, uh, episode, uh, and, and of course today is the first anniversary of the lockdown, um, so it's very relevant, but it has shown a real problem where we've delegated too many powers. We should, in my view, have a layered approach, whether it's a UK-wide layer at the top, um, where, you know, we, we, can, we can stop this sort of, uh, uh, I think taking things to extremes and, and deliberate uh, mechanism to, or the use of devolution to undermine the British Union. So a layered approach rather than silo is my first point. Um, the second point is, I think we need to be a lot cleverer with the Barnett formula, um, which even Lord Barnett uh, says, you know, has is, 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 is really sort of outlived its uh, usefulness in many ways. I'm not saying get rid of Barnett in any way, but what I'm saying is, you know, let's be a bit cleverer about how we allocate those monies. At the moment, it's just a block to Scotland or Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, you know, could we not to do it in a way that you actually pay directly to the Scottish NHS or Welsh NHS, um, you know, with have a bit more control over it rather than just give them a block of money which they can use against us. And I particularly feel the union is undermined when um, you know, Scotland, for example, I was at Edinburgh University, proud to have gone there. Um, but, you know, they, they, they charge or they treat English students very differently. Um, you know, you get free, no, no fees to go if you uh, live in Scotland. You can be English living in Scotland, get no fees. And I think, you know, things like that actually break up the union. And we should, the Westminster government should have a layered approach, you know, we should be looking at things like that. I know this is not good for the union uh, and you can't do things that are actually undermining the union. That, that, that's my view. Um, so be a bit clever about Barnet without getting rid of it. The SNP actually do want to get rid of it. Incredibly, Kate Forbes, their spokesman, has, has um, endorsed a report by Andrew Wilson on that. Um, and, you know, that hopefully we can deploy. Um, and finally, I think attitude. Uh, I mean, this seminar is about um, how do we fight back? I think unionists tend to look often like we're caught in the headlamps, uh, like a rabbit in the headlamps, you know, and we, we can't actually do anything about this oncoming uh, threat. I think we need to be a lot more robust. We shouldn't, we should stop appeasing and just giving bows away. And we should say, right, no, hang on a minute. You know, this is British money, or in fact, it's English money, some of it. Um, you know, and we, we need to actually uh, a more sensible approach to this and to agree it. And, and I think a pushback like that is required. But I'll be very interested to know what the panel thinks. Um, and on that note, I'll just pass on to the panel. We're going to go England first.
Northern Ireland, Wales, and then Scotland. And delighted, uh, we've got our own very own Andrew Allison, head of campaigns for us at the Freedom Association, formerly um, with the Taxpayers Association, did a great job there for five years, um, and worked for the Brexit Party in the European Parliament. Um, and um, Andrew, I'm surprised you're not representing independence for Yorkshire coming from Beverly, Andrew, but you're going to speak about England first to get, uh, get, get the ball rolling. Uh, well, thank you very much, David. Uh, and yes, of course, there are many people in Yorkshire who do want independence, just like they do down in Cornwall, but I, I don't think we've got the time to cover that uh, uh, this evening. Um, as you can see behind me is uh, a lovely Union Jack. It's behind me in all meetings, webinars, broadcast interviews that I do. Everyone knows what I stand for. I am a unionist without a doubt. But although I am a unionist, it's not at all costs. Uh, and I don't believe in offering bribes or, or appeasing, particularly in Scotland, uh, the, the, the SNP. Now, just before the Scottish referendum in September 2014, I did have an article published on Conservative Home. Now, I didn't write the title, in all fairness, but it did say why I, as a unionist, now support an independent Scotland. Now, a lot of that was not me really sort of believing everything that I've written myself, but I was trying to represent a viewpoint that was going on in England. Um, I, I didn't think, and I still don't think, that independence would be economically good for Scotland. Uh, far from it. I actually think it would be a, a disaster. But there was a lot of bickering going on at the time, and there was a lot of nastiness. And, you know, I found that going up to Scotland at times as an Englishman, you tend to get a bit more abuse simply because you're English. Um, and I, I, I've just got a little quote from that article. I said that the idea that all of us should fly, fly a saltire from the roofs of our houses is frankly embarrassing. And that was once suggested during that campaign. And I said, if we're, what are we going to plan next? Three flights from Glasgow Airport to fly over England for teary-eyed Scots to witness this display of flag wearing. And I said, sorry, folks, I'm not going to go down on both knees begging Scotland to stay. And that is still very much my position. And of course, David Cameron, in a, in a moment of blind panic, I think is the only way you could describe it, uh, because of one rogue opinion poll that put independence in the lead, offered Gordon Brown carte blanche to do anything that he wanted. Um, and therefore, you know, Scotland was going to get much, much better devolution and was going to get more money as a result. And, and Scotland's um, you know, per head of population spend in Scotland is 17% above the UK average. That's about 20% above, above England. But John Redwood at the time said something, uh, and it still stands today, he's absolutely right. He said, if Scotland does vote no on Thursday, this is a few days before the referendum, what is on offer is a first class devolution for Scotland with Wales languishing in the second division and England getting nothing. And I think that is absolutely true. This is basically what, what has happened. Therefore, I would say that, that an English parliament is necessary because of devolution. I'm not a big fan of devolution at all, but we can't get rid of it. Um, this would mean that um, English MPs, well, MPs representing English constituencies, let's get back absolutely correct, sitting in the House of Commons as an English parliament, and only those MPs allowed to speak and vote on matters pertaining to England. And I think that that is, that is only fair now. Um, as for the SNP, and I'm sorry to sort of touch on Scotland for too much here, and I know Brian will, will have his ideas, but, but the SNP, I just want to sow division. Um, they really bite the hand that feeds you know, we hear Ian Blackford um, maybe trying to audition for Braveheart, I don't know, but he's complaining that the people of Scotland will never forgive this betrayal. Sorry for my accent there, but you know, he's, he's what betrayal? Uh, Scotland has got Devo Max. The, the Scottish First Minister is in charge of everything in Scotland, apart from defence and security, foreign policy. Um, they, they, they've got everything that they, that they could actually possibly want, but it's always a betrayal. And of course, whenever a minister announces a new policy with spending implications, the first question you will always hear from an SNP MP is, what about the Barnard consequentials? Always interested in grabbing as much money as they can, quite possibly out of a lot of English people. And that really does sow division in the rest of the UK, particularly among English people. I mean, there is a, a, a recent survey, a Savanta Comres poll for ITV's Tonight programme, that said that more than a third of older English adults, not the younger people, Older English adults, 50, uh, 55 plus, 36% stated they would not care at all if Scotland became an independent country. And I think that is very worrying. 
uh, considering they have literally have been brought up with the Union. But of course, it's not just as easy to say, well, England can survive. England can economically survive without, without, without any other constituent part of the Union. I've got, I've got no doubt about that with the City of London. But there are other areas, uh, other, other issues to explore. I mean, for example, the United Nations Security Council, we're a permanent member of it. But it's the UK that's a permanent member of it. If the UK started to break up, would England be automatically be a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council? That is not decided. What would our role in NATO be? That is, that is important. Uh, I was looking at actually an article, um, it was in the UK Defence Journal in July 2018, and it was by Alistair Cameron, who was a former British Army officer and the founder of Scotland and Union. Um, and he said in strategic terms, there is no doubt that the UK's defences will be weakened if Scotland left. This applies in terms of basing locations as well as in size and soft power influence. If Scotland left the UK, other powers might take the opportunity to question, again, of what I've just said, whether the UK should still have that permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. So, you know, an independent Scotland wouldn't just weaken its own defences and, and its own security, but it would also weaken the defence and the security of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And that's at a time when numerous threats are, are around the world. This is the last time we need to be breaking up the union. This is the time when we really should be sticking together uh, and, uh, and doing it together. But if I just finish my little section here, so I don't want to go on too long, David, and I've got a lot of questions to, to, to answer. But the, the, there is a question posed by this webinar, uh, you know, and how do we fight back? Well, I think certainly in Scotland, um, the unionist voices do have to fight back together. Now, I don't know anything about George Galloway and he's all for unity and things like that, whether that's a good idea or not. Brian will be able to tell us more about that. But on face value, it looks like something that could actually weaken the SNP. And anything that weakens the SNP is good for me. So, I, so I'm happy with that. But of course, it's not just, you know, uh, Scotland. I mean, uh, that same uh, Savannah Comores poll for tonight said that 39% of people in Wales are now in favour of independence. And that's the highest ever recorded in an opinion poll. 43% of people in Northern Ireland will vote to unify with the Republic of Ireland, uh, with 72% reasoning that the country is historically Irish. So there are, so there are problems there as well. Um, so I do believe that this union is one of the oldest and most successful political unions in history. And I do say long may it remain so, but also, as I've also previously said, it's, it's not at any cost. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Andrew. Uh, it's it's funny actually, but uh, I was I'm related to Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman, who who was Prime Minister in 1907 when the union was celebrated, and uh, he called it a mighty construct. Um, but he also believed in what there was a campaign then about home rule all round, which meant an English Parliament, as well as parliaments for Ireland, Scotland, and, and Wales. So it's 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 there's it a lot of history actually. This notion. Um, on that note, I'm delighted to um, turn to an old friend, um, uh, Kate Hoye, um, who was a, a wonderful Labour MP, a great stalwart um, for many values, including Brexit, um, and is a real true friend of Northern Ireland, and, and what did serve as a Home Office Minister under Labour, obviously, and, um, and was responsible for getting the Olympics to Britain. Uh, Art, uh, as Minister of Sport under that government um, and we're delighted to see her now as a Baroness so uh, Baroness uh, would you like to talk about Northern Ireland now? Well thank you very much and, and can I say thanks to the um, Freedom Association for um, organising this and I think probably there's never been a time when a Freedom Association is actually more needed in our country um, looking at some of the things that are happening at the moment. Um, I, I, I want to start off just a little bit about the general position of, of, of the Union and being at risk and before I go on to Northern Ireland. Uh, I mean, I think we're all to blame, all of us who do believe in the Union uh, are to blame in a way because for many, many years, people just didn't speak up for the Union. They didn't, they didn't uh, in any way make an attempt to sell the benefits of it. We all took it for granted. And I think particularly, probably the English um, are, are, are more responsible for that than anyone else because, you know, for me, the union in terms of England, um, England needs us as much as we need England. And I think that's very, very important. But, you know, it, Brexit has certainly changed the whole 
nature of the discussion now, because for those people who didn't want to leave the EU, um, they, they are enjoying the fact that they can try and having denigrated our country, not being able to look after itself and do things on its own before we left are now kind of using, I think, the whole attack on the union as quite a useful uh, mechanism for them to continue their sort of almost anti-British um, attitudes. And I think we have been apologists for being British. I think you, you sort of referred to that a little bit at the beginning, David. Um, in the flag issue is, is a very good example. I mean, I, I never have understood why we are so uh, hesitant about flying our flag. I mean, I think all our government buildings and all our institutions should fly the flag all the time. I, I absolutely see no reason why we should, shouldn't be, um, you know, should be in any way afraid of that. Um, obviously, at one stage, the flag was seen as being in the, in the grip of you know, very right wing extremists. But when we did begin to take it back, there was, there was still this um, idea that somehow, you know, that's not what the British do. They don't need to show the flag. And I thought we saw just the other day in that morning, BBC morning programme, where the two BBC journalists, you know, I thought behaved shockingly in, in terms of attitude to a, a government minister having a flag. And yet they would have said nothing about, you know, any time an Irish uh, minister comes on, there's an Irish flag flying or there's an EU flag flying. No one ever criticizes that. So I think we have to be much more upfront and, and, and speaking out and stop being so sort of unassuming and almost humble about the union. Now in Northern Ireland, of course, this year, it's the centenary 100 years ago since Northern Ireland uh, was created. And originally I think COVID has obviously affected quite a lot of some of the, the celebrations, but, even before that, you know, you've sensed that there was a reluctance by the government, the UK government, to treat it as anything other than, oh, well, I suppose we'll have to do something about the centenary. And I think that's been really the problem with what's, what a lot of what is happening in, in Northern Ireland, that for too long, the UK government has taken the attitude that they should be neutral. Uh, somehow on the union with Northern Ireland. They're not neutral on Scotland. They go and campaign. If there's a, you know, on the independence referendum, they campaign for conservatives to um, be, uh, get elected. Uh, but in Northern Ireland, um, and it's, you know, with Tony Blair as well and Labour governments, it's always been, oh, no, 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 we have to be very careful here. We have to be neutral. Now, the Irish government isn't in the slightest bit neutral when it comes to Northern Ireland's place within the union and their demand and their keenness to get a united Ireland. And I do think that the Conservative Party, whilst they certainly have put more effort into having conservative, a Conservative association in Northern Ireland, they haven't really put the effort into getting what I would call normal politics in Northern Ireland. And Labour has just been as bad, in fact, even worse, because the Labour Party does not uh, stand candidates. They allow people to join, they take the money and they have a Northern Ireland association, but they don't actually put up mm. candidates. And I do think that's very important. Now, clearly at the moment, uh, the whole centenary and everything to do with that has been affected by the protocol. And I'm, you know, I'm almost tired of talking about it, but I just want to go over very, very quickly the crucial issues on that. Uh, and can I say at the beginning that I very much welcome the um, uh, the move of putting David Frost in charge and I, of our relationship and the co-chairing the committee, which is to look into the details of the protocol. Um, and I have to say, uh, I've said it publicly, but I think Michael Gove has been actually very, very anti-union in, in the way he has behaved. Um, sorry, sorry to all you conservatives listening in, but I really do not think that he was in the right place at the right time. Uh, the protocol was designed, um, and again, I'm going to defend the Prime Minister on this because I think the, our Parliament, and I was a member of it right up until nearly the end uh, of the Brexit process, did, did everything they could to stop Brexit. And I think the Prime Minister and uh, leading members even of the ERG uh, were put in that very, very difficult position uh, that they, want, they had to get Brexit over the line. And because of the, 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 the campaigning of the Irish government, linking in with the European Union, using Northern Ireland and the Belfast Agreement as the kind of weapon to destroy uh, and to make it as difficult as possible, in the end, there's no doubt about it that the government gave in. They gave in to the threat, the, the alleged threat of what would happen if we happened to have some kind of uh, trade border at the frontier. 
And it's almost as if, you know, when people talk about it, there's no border on the island of Ireland. Well, A, there is a border because there's a frontier. It's a different country with a different currency, the different uh, corporation tax, different mileage, euro. Everything is different about it. Um, so there is a frontier. But also the way the protocol is now working, there is a border on the island of Ireland. It's not in the Irish Sea. Boats aren't crossing over the Irish Sea and being, being stopped in the middle of the sea, as people talk about almost. It's in Northern Ireland. It's at Larn, it's at Belfast. So there is a border on the island of Ireland. So all those people who said we had to stop that. But also the whole question of consent has been, been destroyed because it, the, the argument was that after four years, the Northern Ireland Assembly could decide whether they wanted the protocol. But the consent principle, very, very much part of the Belfast Agreement, as put forward very strongly by a brilliant article by David Trimble, one of the, uh, the founders, really, of the, the instigators of the Belfast Agreement. It, it, the consent principle has been changed, so it's, it's going to be a majority in the Assembly, and the whole idea that one, one community could stop something happening, uh, you know, it, it's, that's been stopped and that's been changed without any consent from people in Northern Ireland. The protocol is not only bad in terms of the way it's affected all the businesses and the difficulties of getting things across and the ridiculous thing that we weren't allowed to bring British soil into Northern Ireland, that's now being stopped, uh, but I mean it really was ludicrous and there's little things every day that still come out, but even if all the tinkering around and the fixing of things and the extending the grace periods which is what the government is now pushing and Brandon Lewis who of course started off right away at saying there is no border there is no border there is no border he's had to admit yes there is a trade border but we're going to make it as light as possible we're going to extend when the really tough things come in all of that will make no difference to the constitutional position so Northern Ireland not only is there a threat to the union from people you know overall in the United Kingdom maybe wanting to have more independence in Wales and Scotland but actually the, the British government itself my government has actually brought in the threat to the union and I just would warn people that there's somehow this idea because it's always Great Britain and Northern Ireland a little bit of an aside do not underestimate the relationship between Northern Ireland and Scotland and, you know, whatever happened in Scotland, it would have a huge influence in Northern Ireland. And whatever happens in Northern Ireland in terms of any kind of um, referendum would affect Scotland as well. So the union, you know, has been put at risk by our own government. But I have to say those opinion polls, the one poll that gave, I think, 43 percent is not is not what is actually that all the other polls show a much, much smaller um, a percentage of people who would support um, going into a United Ireland and you know the, there's a whole debate to be held on the economy aspects of just how much worse off we would be if there was a United Ireland but I'm not in the union and I'm not supporting the union because of money obviously we're very grateful it's wonderful the Covid situation the vaccination that has gone on in Northern Ireland has been amazing in comparison to what's happening in the Republic but for me it's not about money and I do get very angry with some of my own sort of pro-union well certainly the un unionist parties who push the money attitude the union is much more than about money. And if we just rely on it being about money, then to me, that is ignoring all the, the wonderful things about the culture. So we've got to, in, in, in Northern Ireland, I want to see the rest of the United Kingdom giving much more support to people, to pro-union people in Northern Ireland, to recognize that the protocol is breaking the Belfast Agreement and is breaking indeed the Act of Union and working with us and supporting us in our legal challenge which eventually will end up in the Supreme Court, but hopefully before that, the government, um, including the Prime Minister, who I genuinely feel wants to do something about this, that behind the scenes, we can get this altered because otherwise Northern Ireland is just being driven further and further away from the rest of the United Kingdom, and that's not good for the union. Um, Baroness, thank you so much for that. Uh, that's, um, you, you speak with great truth and, and force. Uh, I was I was I was special advisor ninety six ninety seven when the peace process started under Paddy Mayhew, um, and I, I think you're right about uh, David Trimble. Uh, he he was very very important to the process, and I do very admire his position on this. He really understands uh, the issues clearly. Um, and also, you know, you can see, I mean, people don't realise, I mean, you can, you get a great view of Scotland from the Antrim Hills and mm -hmm. um, the top of Northern Ireland, you know, that, that, and, and this tunnel idea of Boris, I think is very feasible, it's the same as a channel tunnel, and would be great for the Union, I don't think it's a silly idea, I think it's very pragmatic, mm -hmm. 
way theoretical. Um, so there are a lot of issues there, but thank you very much for that summary. Um, we'll turn now to, to Wales and another old friend in, in um, um, and uh, stalwart of the Freedom Association in, in David Jones, um, MP, who was an Assembly member uh, before becoming an MP and um, was an excellent Brexit minister and very, uh, very clear about no deal being an entirely feasible option on Brexit. And, uh, you know, I was a very important uh, advocate of that. Um, so, David, please uh, fill us in on the Welsh situation, which is a bit concerning with uh, all the borders being closed, etc. <laughs> we carry on. Well, lost my thigh, David. Uh, um, it's, it's very good to be here this evening. Um, I was brought up uh, in a small village uh, in North Wales, which was primarily Welsh speaking. Uh, and in those days, there was very little talk of Wales as being something separate from the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, there was this understanding that we were different, certainly, but we were all part of a, a greater British entity. Uh, we all, for example, supported Liverpool Football Club, or if we had particularly bad taste, maybe Manchester United. <laughs> certainly, we in North Wales would not be supporting Swansea City or Cardiff City or any of the other teams from South Wales. Because uh, in those days, really, the orientation in Wales was east-west. Uh, it was a state of affairs that we were completely happy with. Uh, we uh, understood our neighbours and we all got on very well together. And I blame a lot of what has happened over the strains that are now afflicting the United Kingdom, as indeed I blame most things upon Tony Blair. It was uh, Tony Blair, of course, who uh, back uh, in 1997, promised a referendum on devolution for both the Scots and the Welsh. Uh, the reason he did it for the Scots was because he had huge problems uh, with his Scottish party and he wanted to placate them. Uh, but he didn't have the same pressures from it within Wales. Blair was very clever. Uh, he called a referendum, which he knew he would win uh, in Scotland, and then had a similar referendum in Wales, but 10 days later, 10 days later. So the uh, Welsh electorate knew that the Scots had already voted for devolution. Mm. And the Welsh voted for devolution too. But there was a turnout of about 50%. Mm. And the majority across the whole of Wales was around 6,000, 6,000 votes. Now, I mention this not because I want to turn the clock back or because I want to deny devolution, but the, what I want to point out is that in those days, back in 1997, there was no great clamour for Wales to be governed any differently uh, from any other part of the United Kingdom. Now, it's quite clear that the uh, support for devolution has grown since then. Uh, it's grown for many reasons. Uh, part of the reason, of course, is that the the Welsh Assembly, or now the, uh, as it's known, the Welsh Parliament and the Welsh Government have done a great deal in the intervening years to seek to hollow out the significance and importance of Westminster from Welsh uh, public life. This has been a, a straightforward process of seeking to accrue more powers because like most institutions, the Welsh Government wants to accrue more power to itself. So, uh, HMG has been virtually airbrushed out of Wales. And that is, of course, partly explains why there was always such popularity among the, uh, the, the, the Welsh ruling classes for, uh, the, um, for, 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 for the European Union, because it was a way of bypassing Westminster. Funding came mm -hmm. from uh, Brussels, and it was then passed down to the Welsh government. And it was quite open to the Welsh government, therefore, to say, well, you know, this is the support, the financial support that we're getting from Europe. It's Wales and Europe working together. A new a road a project would have the Welsh dragon and the European flag emblazoned on it. No sign of the Union flag or any indication of where the money had originally come from, because, of course, it was British taxpayers' money that had been recirculated. Um, of course, um, 
that was uh, the, the, this was all aided and abetted by um, by Westminster, or to be more to be more accurate, Whitehall, because for the best part uh, of a de of two decades, uh, Whitehall was quite content to devolve and forget. It, it took a load of problems off the table of of officials in in, in Whitehall. They could say that this was a devolved competence and the Welsh government had to deal with it and it was one problem less. Uh, and this is something that shamefully government after government allowed to continue to happen. And the consequence is that we have now got a generation of young Welsh people who can't really remember the days when Wales, uh, Welsh people regarded themselves as both Welsh and British and were quite happy and content with that dual status. Mm. Um, this government is changing things. And one of the questions we have to consider today is how do we fight back? Yeah. Well, I actually do think that the fight back has begun. And the fight back has begun in the shape of Boris Johnson and his government and the UK Internal Market Act 2020, which was passed toward the end of last year. And this piece of legislation was met with howls of outrage from uh, both the, the Scottish and Welsh establishment, because what the UK internal market does for the first time in over 20 years is to allow the United Kingdom government to apply UK funds to spend on certain projects within the devolved parts of the country. Now, this is really important. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, there has been a huge issue in South Wales for many, many years over the state of the M4 road uh, near Newport. Any of you who have travelled along that road will know that you have to travel through um, two very narrow tunnels, the Bryn Glass Tunnel near Newport, in order to continue on your journey towards, uh, towards Pembrokeshire and, of course, ultimately the ferry to Ireland. Um, the Welsh Government have been talking about a new uh, bypass for the M4 road for very many years. They carried out a study. They spent 140 odd million pounds worth of taxpayers' money. And then they decided that they weren't going to bother with it at all. Now, this is something that outraged the people of South Wales who desperately need that important piece of infrastructure. The UK Internal Market Act will enable the British government to spend that money on upgrading the infrastructure. And let me give you an, an indication of the extent to which the Welsh government have decided to hollow out the importance of, of, of Westminster in Cardiff. When it was suggested that the British government should actually provide the money for the upgrade of the road, the response of Mark Drakeford, the first minister of Wales was, we don't want the money, it's our competence, we want to do it ourselves. Um, so I actually think that the UK Internal Market Act, it may well be the first flickering of a new dawn in Wales. There is a lot more, of course, that we need to do. Kate mentioned quite properly uh, the uh, sneering comments of the two news presenters on uh, the BBC the other day. Mm. But actually the BBC issue is far more important than their attitude to the flag. Mm. The BBC is our national broadcaster. Yeah. It is the British Broadcasting Corporation. And I actually think that the uh, BBC has got a patriotic duty to play its part in United the Kingdom rather than seeking to separate it. Mm. I think, however, that anybody who lives in any of the devolved parts of the United Kingdom will know uh, that their local or their regional uh, BBC stations frequently seem to be encouraging the separatist attitude that we're discussing today. It's certainly the case in Wales. Uh, yeah. If you look, for example, at their political unit, one uh, of their reporters has be uh, became a Plaid Cymru candidate and indeed is now a, a Plaid Cymru member of the Welsh Parliament. Another one became uh, the political, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the journalistic advisor to Plaid Cymru. And we've just had the appointment to a senior directoral role in BBC Wales of the past chief executive of Plaid Cymru. 
And I've no doubt that Brian is going to be telling us about similar things that go on in Scotland too. The BBC really does need to be looked at very seriously by the British government because the BBC could play a hugely important role in uniting this country and helping to rebuild the sense of British identity that the people of Wales had robbed from them by Tony Blair. So um, that, I think, is a good place for us to maybe start the discussion. What should we do about the BBC? <laughs> um, exactly. There's a whole new webinar uh, which the Freedom Association would probably be delighted to take it up on. David, uh, thanks so much for that. Actually, just on your point about the BBC, I noticed in their coverage of Sturgeon today, um, you know, I think it's a bit pandering, and the BBC Scotland have not challenged um, Sturgeon. And it, actually, there is a. I was a candidate in Glasgow Rutherglen years ago, after my first seat, but. I was very aware that, you know, there's almost like institutional corruption within a nation where people, you know, but my predecessor was a headmaster, uh, deputy headmaster, and he was told, if you stand for the Conservatives again, um, you will not get headmaster. And this is in, you know, the Lanarkshire area. And it, it, there is that sort of pressure on all institutions, including the media, like within Scotland, um, you know, to toe the line, which I think is very, very concerning. And again, this is why I think you need a layered approach where the UK has some powers to come in and say, hang on, things are not working well here. Uh, and on that note, um, Brian, I think will probably agree that things are not working so well in Scotland at the moment. Um, uh, do you want to uh, talk to us about Scotland, Brian? Let me just uh, introduce you formally. Um, we've had the honour of uh, representing both the Conservatives, uh, Conservative Party in the Scottish Parliament very successfully, um, and then the Brexit Party more recently in the European Parliament. Um, and um, uh, you've been a successful journalist as, and still do some excellent work on the Scotsman newspaper and other publications. So you're, you're an old friend of the Freedom Association again. So great to welcome you back. Uh, over to you, Brian. Oh, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I have to say, I, I, I am tempted to be completely incoherent now, because having heard everything that's gone before, I rather feel like I want to uh, join and acclaim what has been said uh, by Andrew, uh, Kate and David. There's so much there that is true, uh, and I agree with. And, and I see in Scotland replicated in other parts of uh, our great uh, country. Um, I, I was born just at the tail end of the 50s. I was educated in the 60s and 70s in Scottish state schools. I, I grew up being British and Scottish and I, I enjoyed nothing more than the sporting occasions of Scotland being at Wembley and occasionally winning and sometimes being gubbed or winning uh, at Murrayfield against Wales, a, a great Welsh team, but yet we could still occasionally win. Uh, these, were, these were things that, much as there was competition, I felt family, family as in, as in you had competitions with brothers or sisters. And so being Scots, uh, but being British was something that just, I took it from my mother's milk, it was natural. And now, now I find that you know we have to fight we have to proclaim our britishness and i put that down a great deal to a number of politicians not just tony blair conservatives too by the way um you know but the, the real lesson i think that comes out of this is uh how ashamed we have been for too long of being british yeah. in our establishment and, 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 and the unwillingness to fly the flag that has been commented on already. You know, the BBC, as David talks about, you know, it used to proclaim Britishness and its values, its positive values. Of course, every country makes its mistakes. Every country has things it can be shameful about. But, you know, on the balance, on the balance, being British was something we all felt proud about for what we had done, what we had achieved what we'd given and sacrificed. And goodness me, you know, now we cower, we cower. 
And it is, it is appalling. It is appalling. And, and, and what we have done is we have appeased. And you know, appeasement always fails. It always fails. And, and what we have done is we have rewarded the nationalists. And I mean that nationalist uh, thing very strongly. Um, and, 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 and those of us who um, are from, from, you know, Northern Ireland and Wales and Scotland, we, we are probably closer to nationalism than, than and most English people in the sense that we, we come across it. People who seek to divide us, people who seek to other, other the English. I mean, how disgraceful. If this was done against people of the religion or their color, it would be, it would be treated with complete disdain. And, uh, but no, <laughs> you know, I see it in Scotland all the time, the othering of people because they might come from England or they might have an English accent, even though they might be Scottish, by the way. <laughs> it is absolutely appalling. So we, we have to recognize that the appeasement has not worked. Oh, if we give some institutional change, if we, if we actually give some more money, and I very much agree with what Kate said about the money issue. Money is not what matters. I want a Scotland, I want a Scotland that contributes to the treasury, not takes from it. Yeah. I want to be proud that my, my home nation, the Scottish nation, contributes to the treasury mm -hmm. and helps people in other parts of England that are poorer. I mean, the, the, gift, the gift of oil and the tax revenues that came from it went to Scotland. It actually contributed to easing the pain of coming out of the heavy industry and the mining and the steel bashing industries that we had. But it also contributed to the same in, 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 in the rest of the, of the UK. And, and of course, now we've had, now we've had many years when in fact, as the oil revenues have uh, depleted, that in fact, we in Scotland have actually been the recipients of help. This is called pooling and sharing. It's a great thing. It's what countries do. They spread their revenues, they spread their help. They have solidarity. This is important. But what we have allowed is the diminution of British solidarity. So yes, let's, let's do things like flying the flag. It's very important to me, but yes, also, let's actually look at what institutions work and in what way they work. I remember when I was involved in the 79 referendum uh, about uh, devolution, that the universities did not want to be part of a Scottish devolved assembly. They wanted to be part of the UK. By the time it came in 97, uh, they had changed their minds. They'd been convinced that they should, oh, no, we might have more power, more, more money. Well, how much have they paid since then? Because, of course, what has happened is that they've been sucked into this whole nationalism and they've been dim diminished by not being part of the UK system. To the extent which Scots families living in England have to pay to go to a Scottish university. English, Welsh... Northern Irish families going to Scottish universities have to pay to go to Scottish universities. But people from the EU were not being asked to pay. That, that was clearly ridiculous. And we now have the situation in Scotland that Scots educated in Scotland actually are turned down in preference to overseas students because they pay. There's a cap and it stops the meritocracy of Scots who come from poor backgrounds but have qualifications not getting into university in their own backyard. It is absurd. Yeah. Nationalism divides us. It splits us up. It puts us against each other. And there's no, absolutely no need for it. We need to reclaim our institutions. We need to reclaim our flag. Not because, not because it actually is something that is about all the good we've done and it's also about some of the mistakes we've made but we can be proud that we've recognized those mistakes and we have freedom of speech and debate to actually discuss them but strangely the people the same people who want to not allow us to fly the flag are the same people who want to introduce restrictions on our freedom of speech who want to shut us up so i would say that being yeah. part of britain uh, is not about money, it's about the heart. 
It's about believing we're British. And we need to work far harder on that. And we need to stop appeasing uh, nationalists by actually saying, here's the good that we do. The good that we do around the world, the good that we do in our country, how we look out for each other. If we do all that, then I actually think we will turn the tide. And I, I, I recognize the mistakes Boris has made with things such as the protocol, but I also recognize the uh, triumph of some of the changes he's seeking to make in uh, overriding uh, these devolved parliaments who would rather create grievance than actually build solidarity. And solidarity must be our goal. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Brian. That, that's excellent. Um, if I may, there are a number of questions that uh, have come up. Um, I see there's some more, but if I take um, some of these first, or perhaps try and group them, um, it's uh, interesting questions. For, uh, Simon Richards, what do we think of Galloway's approach, that is, of um, uh, Alliance for Unity? You know, can that work? Um, uh, sort of uh, using one's the two votes in the Scottish Parliament elections, one for constituency, one for the party list. If you use it um, uh, strategically, does that work or not? That's one uh, question. Um, uh, another one from uh, Peter Thomas about whether Westminster itself should move to to PR proportional representation. Would that help? Um, and one on homelessness, which is certainly uh, it's an interesting field, you know, does, 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 um, do we get a better treatment of homeless uh, people as part of this mix? Um, do you want to take those three first and then there's another three I'll look at and come back on. Um, uh, so who wants to go first on that, on those questions? David, do you want to uh, lead the way? Well, if I could, um... Sorry, I'm usually muted. Uh, if I could uh, deal with the issue of proportional representation, um, I've actually always thought that the best argument against proportional representation is that it's profoundly undemocratic. Uh, it means uh, that very small parties can hold the balance of power and thereby exert an authority which is completely disproportionate to the support that they have uh, more generally in, in the country. It also means that people start owing their first loyalty to their party rather than to their electorate. Uh, and finally, I can't really see uh, what's wrong and what's so undemocratic about a system in which the person who actually gets the most votes wins. So it, it's always seemed to me that the PR, uh, the complaint about PR uh, is a complaint that is usually uttered by people who know that they never have a chance of winning power under uh, any first-past-the-post system. Um, the, um, the issue of voting tactically, again, uh, is one where I, I used to say, no, always vote for the candidate representing the party you wish to support. Uh, th th that is the best way in the long run to achieve what you want. And I hate to say this, but the um, result in the last European uh, election, I think, made it very, very clear that a large number of people throughout the country had decided to vote tactically. And the consequence of that tactical voting had a result that was not reflected in the European Parliament itself, but was reflected at Westminster uh, with the um, defenestration of the last Conservative government. So maybe there is something in that. What, one point that was mentioned was the, um, the, the, the uh, pro-British alliance. I, I actually think that people who are in favor of unionism should be pooling their resources at the moment. I think that the country is facing a huge threat from those who want to tear it asunder. And it's not just people who actually uh, represent at the SNP and Plaid Cymru. It's also a lot of other people who, uh, if you like, are the fellow travelers of the SNP uh, and Plaid Cymru. Uh, I think of, on this issue, people need to wear their loyalty to their country on their sleeve. And just as we had an alliance, uh, a cross-party alliance, which secured us the victory uh, in the uh, European referendum, 
so I believe we can have a cross-party alliance that will mm -hmm. uh, ensure the continuation of our union, because our union is much more important than party politics. It's what we are, and I think that we should be we should be working together for that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, David. Um, Kay, Kay, do you want to? Yeah, well, I, do, I, I very much agree. Um, I've never been a, 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 a supporter of um, proportional representation. I did sort of think about it, you know, at times when you saw, um, you know, for example, in the early days when um, parties that you kind of supported, like the UKIP brand of UKIP, which wanted to leave the European Union and they would never get a chance of ever getting in. But I do genuinely think that, um, you know, first past the post, and particularly if you are an MP, you want to have your constituency and your, your and once you're elected, you know, you, you support, and you help everybody, whether they voted for you or not. Um, on the, on the, the Scottish thing, I think George Galloway has been very brave actually. And I think he's done a, a terrific job in bringing together that, um, unity slate. Uh, it's just unfortunate that neither of the two main parties seem to want to in any way cooperate with them. And I think that is a mistake because I do think that this particular election is absolutely crucial. And if we, you know, if, if there's anything that could be done putting uh, uh, another candidate who's got a better chance of winning first to help bring about the downfall of the SNP or particularly to stop them getting a mandate for another referendum, even if, you know, we hope Boris would ignore the, the mandate, it's still, um, I think, important. And I'm, I'm just sorry that George, who I've known for a very, very long time, and I know he, I don't agree with him on a few things, particularly views on Ireland and so on, but um, he is someone who has got huge charisma and, you know, people should be working with him for this election. Yes, I mean, just on that point, he was, um, he's been subject to a, a threat on his life. Uh, I'm sure you, and, mm. and Douglas Ross as well, someone's been arrested. So uh, it's quite, you know, he, he has been brave, I think, in standing up for that. Um, um, Andrew, do you want to say something on that? Well, yeah, I just want to echo what's been said, really, more than anything else. Um, George Galloway is a very brave man. I mean, I think we disagree on just about anything, anything and everything. Um, but he is a brave man. He does have a lot of charisma, as, as Kate said. And I think if anyone can do this with this Alliance for Unity list, then it's it's George Galloway mm. who, who can do it. And I really wish him all the best of luck because that that's the only way that we, we, we we're going to get rid of the of the SNP. If I could also just very briefly just touch on just a couple of the comments that have been made by other speakers. I agree with you, Kate, that, you know, it's. England does need the other constituent countries of the of the UK. All I was trying to say is that if, if you just look at it in purely economics, which I agree you should mm. not do, then of course England could survive, you know, perfectly yeah. well. And certainly on the flying of the flag, I mean, I wrote, I wrote a piece for our website um, last week where I, where I just commented that you wouldn't get an, an interviewer in the United States sort of sniggering away at, at any politician, be they Republican or Democrat, if they had a flag of the United States behind them because they're proud of their country and they're proud of their flag. Um, and that's why, you know, I have that behind me. I mean, I've been accused of being a, a flag, well, I mean, really say the word, uh, copulating with a flag, basically, uh, this, the, the, this past week, which, which I found rather discombobulating simply because the people who are really having a go at me seem to love wrapping themselves around the EU flag. And getting their, their face painted with, 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 with an EU flag. And just to touch on what David said, absolutely with the BBC, again, unsurprisingly, oh, yeah. I've been writing about that this, this past week. You know, it's, they've, just, they've just completely forgotten what the first B stands for. It's been said by many people, but it's true. It's worth emphasizing. It's the British Broadcasting Corporation. It's there to promote Britain around the country, around the world. Uh, and, it, and it's just ashamed of its country and with so many of its presenters, well, they would rather wrap themselves around with, uh, with an EU flag than a, than a Union Jack. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's worth saying, I was in advertising years ago, but, but it seems to me with the Union, the British Union, there is no brand support, as you would say, like, you know, top brands spend a lot of money, Coca-Cola or whatever, to support the brand, even though everyone knows Coca-Cola. Um, but we, you know, no one is pushing the British Union uh, brand. Um, the British government isn't really. We're not putting money behind it, and we need to do a lot more of that. 
because the SNP are pushing yes everywhere and, and the Saltaire and, you know, that, that's brand support in marketing terms. And um, we need to counter it, in my view. And the other point is, you know, Liverpool City Council, we may have to take control of it. So when things go very wrong, the government retains powers at really quite a large level. And why don't we, that's a good example of, you know, could we not do that for if, if Scotland gets too extreme or, or too nationalistic or whatever, in certain aspects, should Westminster retain the power? It's, these are all delegated powers for Westminster um, to, to say, look, this is not acceptable. You know, um, if things are out of control, I, I think that is important whilst respecting devolution, of course. Um, sorry, uh, Brian, do you want to take those questions? Yeah, I have to say, much as in my youth, I toyed with the idea of uh, proportional representation. Um, I became quickly disavowed of it, uh, even though I was elected. And both times I've been elected by proportional representation. Um, the, the, what, it, what it has done is uh, reward minority parties uh, to, to, as we've seen in other countries, essentially be king makers. And, and this has, of course, resulted in Scotland of the system being gamed. So what we have is, uh, we talk about tactical voting by unionists, but in fact, we have tactical voting in the proportional system in Scotland where many nationalists vote for the Greens. The Greens in Scotland are the only Greens in the whole of the world to put nationalism and secession from the British state before environmental issues. And of course, so the, the nationalists trying, uh, vote in their second vote for the Greens as a way of getting a proxy that will ensure that even if the SNP should not have, be the majority party, which is uh, in most occasions what they wouldn't be, uh, they actually have a, a, a waiting party for a coalition. So, so the idea that, that, that proportional representation somehow is better than uh, the first past the post because uh, it, it, it helps spread the vote. Well, it can be gamed and it can be used against people. And of course, we now have George Galloway. I, I, and I've supported George in his campaign uh, earlier in the year because what he was saying was, well, if the main parties get together in the constituencies, we can do something else in the, in the list vote. But of course, unfortunately, what happened was they were unwilling, and it's no surprise, but they were unwilling to do anything uh, on the first vote uh, that, that involved getting together. Uh, even though, even though, and this is an important point, had they, had they been elected, uh, they would then, uh, if they could form a government or administration, they would have had to get together after the election. My, my question was, well, why not get before? get together before and be honest with the public and say, we must stop the SNP, we're getting together, we're not fighting in each other's seats, blah, blah, blah. No, they could not do this and they will not do it. They never will do it. They will go down fighting because that is what the big parties do. Uh, uh, and and, and I, I felt that and saw that in the 2019 uh, general election, even when the Brexit party gave up its conservative uh, contesting seats, still it was harangued and bullied to not fight any others in case uh, the Conservatives didn't get a majority. Um, let's not go there. That's another debate. I'm sure David would love to talk about it too. But the, the point is proportional representation does not necessarily do what you think it might do. Um, and, and so it's not a panacea. I much prefer first past the post. Uh, I think it's much the better system and it gives, in, it gives people the ability you kick a government out, which proportional representation does not do. Can I just add one thing on that, just to remind people watching that, of course, in Northern Ireland, we have an even more ridiculous situation where we have mandatory coalition. So there has to be a government made up of the two main parties. And that has led to a ridiculous coalition, which is basically one party who believes in the union wants to stay part of the United Kingdom, and another party whose job it is, is to make sure Northern Ireland is not successful. So how you can ever, ever have an assembly that works, you know, anyway. I wonder if I could mention one point, David, as well, about the issue of the flag, which has uh, loomed large in this discussion. 
Um, and that's the question of the uh, flags of the constituent nations of the United Kingdom. Uh, if we're not careful, we'll find that the Saltar of Scotland is appropriated by the SNP and the Red Dragon of Wales is appropriated by Plaid Cymru or other nationalist parties. And we unionists have got to lay claim to those flags as well. There are national flags too, and we have got every right to display them, to show them, to be proud of them. Uh, it's not a, a nationalist, they're, they're not nationalist symbols any more than the union flag is a symbol of oppression. Indeed. No, thank you. Absolutely. I, mean, I always point out, you know, the salt air is at the heart of the union flag as well, we can see. Um, you know, that's where it belongs, in my view. Um, just now, I don't know how long we've got, Andrew. Is it um, we, we can run on to call 15 minutes after 7.15? Is that right? Um, we can go, to, well, if it's, if it's okay with other, with other speakers. Yeah, then, yeah let's take another question. Right, if, if that's all right. In that basis, then, we've got a couple more questions to come in. Graham Erdley has asked, you know, should we go for um, more county structures rather than regional structures? Um, uh, you know, I was, I was aware that in Scotland, the, the counties or a lot of local government actually opposes the Scottish Parliament uh, when they were thinking of setting it up. So it's got, there was a bit of a contest there. Um, so that's at that level. And then um, could we ever see from Richard Johnson the abolition of these assemblies or parliaments? Um, and, um, uh, you know, how do we avoid a second independence referendum from the SNP? If they do well in this election, you know, are we duty bound to um, have a second referendum? That's from Tim Scott. So that just three more questions there. Oh, and sorry, fourth was about Gibraltar. I'm not sure how that fits in, but um, we love Gibraltar, don't we? Um, but yeah, if you could just handle those then and we'll wrap up at uh, um, a quarter past. I'll go if, if everyone wants Go happy. first, Andrew, yeah. It's the one thing we haven't touched on is devolution in England. I mean, many people will remember that John Prescott wanted to put in a Northeast Assembly. Uh, and it was, it was such a popular idea that about 80% of people in my native northeast of England uh, rejected it. They clearly do not like that sort of extra layer of politicians, which is why I said when it comes to an English parliament, the last thing we need, and David, I think, spoke about this very well, you know, you, you get all these extra elected politicians who then have a grievance uh, and try and pit one against, the, you know, one country against the other. And I think the last thing we need, a bunch of sort of English, um, English uh, whatever you would call them, um, do, do, doing exactly the same. Graham makes a very good point on the county structure, but I mean, but unfortunately, I think it falls down a little bit because, you know, I live in Yorkshire and uh, yes, you know, you could, we've had all sorts of problems on devolution in Yorkshire, you know, because where I am in Beverly um, and getting close to the East Coast has absolutely nothing in common with Leeds or Bradford or Sheffield. Um, it's just nothing in common at all. And it's been very difficult. So, so I think, you know, devolution to a certain extent, devolving powers um, to, to, to make them more relevant to local people. Yes, it is good, but I think you've got to be careful how you do it. Uh, and maybe, you know, I mean, Ben Houchen, Conservative Mayor of the Tees Valley, who I've known for a lot of years, I think it's been a very, very good job, but he's got a very, very limited brief. I managed to fly the flag for his area and get him an investment. And he seems to do that very well. Um, so, you know, that, that's certainly, yeah, certainly one. Um, will devolution be abolished? No, sorry, just won't, it's here to stay now. We, we, we stick with it. We're gonna make the best job that we possibly can. As for a sort of an indie ref too, well, I've got absolutely no doubt that um, if the SNP does well in, in May um, and they do secure a majority and it's there at the front and center of their manifesto that we want another referendum, then they could even try to hold one themselves that isn't binding. Um, that's, that's, that's perfectly possible. But I think we need to cross that bridge when we come to it. Let's try and defeat the SNP. Let's unionists get together. I mean, I'll take up what Brian was saying, but as much as we can, uh, get together and, and try and defeat the SNP, and hopefully we'll not have to cross that bridge. Um, okay, uh, Brian, do you want to comment on those questions? Uh, uh, unmute, unmute, unmute. Uh, yeah, one of the things we should have been doing a long time ago is, is actually seeking to bring those those places that wish to be 
represented in Westminster into the Palace of Westminster. I have absolutely uh, every wish that if the Falklands wanted to have a member of parliament in uh, Westminster, they should be entitled to have one. If people from Gibraltar wish yeah. to bind themselves to the United Kingdom, they should have a member of parliament in Westminster. That's how we should be uh, treating, the, for me, the issue of Britishness. Those people who associate themselves as being British should be able to express themselves and have certain uh, representation uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, the French do it. Why, why can't we? But uh, in the sense of devolution, it's not going to go away, but we can certainly uh, look at it, and that means look at it in the context, as Andrew says, in regard to the rest of uh, the country, uh, not just uh, the assemblies or parliaments, but England too. We need to ask ourselves, are, are, are these moralities working? We need to ask ourselves, what's happened to the third sector in parts of uh, the United Kingdom where, where they are now bullied and bribed into being anti-British? So charities don't say anything uh, that might contest uh, the relationship. Um, so I think, there's, I think there's every opportunity to review how these structures work. Um, but let me just say, federalism is not necessarily, like proportional representation, the solution either. Because federalism will, on, will not appease nationalists. Um, if you actually were to say, oh, we will go for home rule systems and, and we'll give the Scottish Parliament more powers, then of course, down the road, within this five to 10 years, they'll be wanting more powers again. And if, if there were to be something like the Iraq war to happen yet again, then what you would have is actually a Scottish Parliament saying, well, that's not our war. For, foreign affairs might be a national, a, a UK thing, but that's not our war. We need independence. The whole idea that federalism somehow will stop nationalism is actually false. Uh, we need to find institutions that pull us together rather than actually give opportunities to drive us apart. And actually, I think uh, many of these so-called solutions uh, store up trouble for the future. I'll leave it there. Yeah, um, uh, David, do you want to go? Yes, th thanks very much, David. Um, county structures, yes, I am a big fan of the counties. They are a sensible administrative unit. Uh, but they govern. Uh, people have got an affinity towards the county that they live in. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure that Andrew would say that he's proud to wear the white robes. Um, I, I, I look back at the old counties of North Wales. I was always a Denbyshire man, you know. Um, but, but there's more than that. Um, at the moment, the, the counties in Wales, and I'll, I'll revert to Wales, are, are in the unfortunate position of also uh, being on the receiving end of attention from the Welsh government. Because uh, what the Welsh government does is try to suck power down from London, from Westminster, but at the same time try to hoover up powers uh, from the counties. So the consequence is that they have uh, built several large administrative buildings right around Wales, which are now in process of taking over some of the functions of the counties. In other words, they're using the counties uh, and their competence in, in, in respect of local government to increase their centralized power. So paradoxically, something which was supposed to be a decentralizing idea has actually increased centralization power rather than being centralized at Westminster is now being centralized at Cardiff. Um, abolition. Um, no, I don't think that we should abolish. Uh, I don't think that there's any need to abolish. I think that the problem with the, uh, devolution as we have it at the moment is that certain politicians in the devolved institutions are using them as power bases to create an alternative structure to that of Westminster. And rather yeah. than abolish, what we need to do is to set out far more cle clearly and stringently the constitutional place of the devolved assembly or parliament, as the case may be. Um, so uh, the, the answer is, I think, no, leave it, leave it there, but don't let, itself, let it set itself up as an alternative to Westminster.
It has a different role, a different function, and it should abide by that. On the issue of the second referendum, well, of course, this is a, 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 a primarily a Scottish issue, but it's also a wider British issue. Um, we were told, weren't we, by Alex Salmon that the last referendum was to be a once-in-a-generation vote. Yeah. They have now come back, as everybody anticipated they would, and asked for another vote. Um, well, uh, actually, I think that we need to have um, a, 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 a bit of common sense. If, if, the, if the SNP say that they want another uh, referendum and they want to fight the referendum uh, on the basis of a commitment to hold, uh, they want to fight the election on the basis of uh, uh, their commitment to hold a referendum, well, maybe we should consider what the terms of the referendum are. Uh, for example, maybe we should go into considerable detail about the, what the referendum question should be. Uh, maybe we should consider who is going to be eligible to vote in that referendum. For example, should Scots who are living in Wales or Northern Ireland or England have a vote? Or even if they're living in the United States or out yeah. of Mongolia, should they have a vote? I would suggest that everyone who is a Scot should have a vote on the future of, 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 its, of the country. Um, and furthermore, I think that if that referendum uh, question were put, it should be accompanied by a detailed explanation of what a yes vote would mean. Would it mean, for example, that there would be a hard border between Scotland and England? Yeah. Would it mean, for example, yeah. that the Scots could not use the pound sterling as a currency? Yeah. These are important questions. Very good. And just a pat yes, no, is not sufficient. People, if they're to have a vote, need to have an informed, educated vote. And I believe it would require all this to be put before, not just the people who live in Scotland, but every Scot who should have a right to vote in that referendum. As a proud uh, Anglo-Scot, I, I want to vote. <laughs> Um, okay, do you want to finish up now? Yeah, just a, just very quickly, Gibraltar, I'm not quite sure what the question was, but I would support uh, Gibraltar having a member of parliament in, in, in the United Kingdom parliament. They're no, they've no longer got an MEP now because they did have somebody, I think, who represented them as well as a certain part of England. So I, I think that would be a, a great idea. They'd probably be more, um, they'd probably come in wearing a Union Jack and, be, and make us all look really, um, you know, yes. very bad. We were so... Uh, so ashamed of our flag. Um, devolution, I mean, I was not a dev I did not support and did not really want devolution in Northern Ireland. We now have ended up with 90 MLAs, members of the assembly, 18 members of parliament, local councils that are gradually getting more power and we're just over governed uh, now. I mean, there's just too many politicians. Um, so I, I would love to see a situation, but I think it's very, very unlikely as everyone says that we're going to go back I'd like to see strong local councils and um, just um, members of parliament and, and um, you know, no, no assembly whatsoever, but I, I don't think that's, that's on. And um, on um, the Scottish issue, uh, I think we have, I mean, I think it's very important that the government before these elections in May and all the other parties, including Labour, says very clearly that they do not, doesn't really matter what's in the SNP manifesto, there is not going to be another referendum. I mean, it's it's it was very very clear um, at the last uh, the last one that it was to be for a, a generation. Um, but I do think that it, it's it's right that if there is going to be one, then it has to be spelled out a lot more, as has been said. But that's probably likely to happen because, of course, people will argue that it wasn't spelled out well enough what Brexit was going to mean. So um, I I. You know, I hope there isn't another referendum, but, you know, if, we're, if we really believe in the union and believe that it actually offers more than just economic um, prosperity for places like Northern Ireland, then, you know, I suppose you could argue that we shouldn't be afraid of a referendum and that we should have to be, you know, gearing ourselves up to getting ready to fight it and to fight it on, 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 the, right, on, on the right terms. Oh, and can I just say on the BBC, I'm very disappointed that the government, I have to say this, David, that the government didn't, okay. although it wasn't in their manifesto, every, practically every cabinet minister said that they would uh, make the BBC licence fee, you know, decriminalise it. And they seem to have completely reneged on that. 
And I just think there is a real appetite out there in the country for the BBC to be to be taken under control <laughs> in the yeah. sense that, you know, yeah. they are just out of control. And all the points that you made earlier, I absolutely agree. Uh, and I am getting so angry now that we have to keep paying a license fee for something that is just not in any way representing our country in, in, in the best possible way. No, well, thank you very much. Um, that, as I say, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have a webinar on, on the BBC to follow, and I, I fully agree with uh, what you're saying. Um, can I thank all the excellent panellists for their contributions? It's been very thought-provoking, and um, it touches on uh, how important the union is to all of us. Um, and how we really must get our act together and, and fight hard for it and do well in these elections, particularly in Scotland coming up, um, and, and address this. And, uh, you know, because it has been around a long time, it's been a very successful partnership and marriage, uh, if you want to use the family terminology. Um, and it's about time we push back and, and stop the appeasement. Thank you so much for your contributions and thank you for your questions and for tuning in and we will put this up um, on the web um, with a bit of editing. Uh, thanks so much and um, uh, enjoy your evening. Thank okay. you.